Today on TechNado, we have the team from StridePoint coming into the studio to talk about security for end users. We're also going to be looking at Wi-Fi 6 and find out how a couple of pen testers wound up in jail. That's all coming up on TechNado, starting right now. Hello and welcome to TechNado. I'm your host, Peter Van Rysdam, joined, as always, by Don Pizzette, to my right, and Justin Dennison, also to my right. How are you guys doing? I'm doing well. It's good to be in the right. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm never in the right. <laughs> exactly. This that Even not right. in this room. No. <laughs> At home, anything. But on TechNado, I like to think that two rights make a wrong. Huh. Yep. Okay. Yeah. For once, finally. <laughs> hey, we got a big show today. We've got a lot of great news to get to. We've also got an interview with Todd Snap and Nathan Caldwell there from Stride Point. Uh, they drove up all the way from Tampa, Florida. And if you don't know where we're located, that could feel like it's a really important thing that they did that. Um, but we're about, about two hours north, so it's not too important. Um, but uh, they're coming up to talk all about um, some fun pen testing and social engineering stuff and uh, and share some some cool stories. So we're going to get to that in a minute. Uh, but as we do the news, uh, if you want to play along with us on Buzzword Bingo, head over to go.itpro.tv slash buzzword dash bingo and you can get your card. And as we say uh, things that I won't say now because you guys have already started, you got your pens out, um, you can check them off as we go. And so... Uh, let's have some fun with that. All right, our first article is from Tom's Hardware. A uh, new Wi-Fi 6 certification is officially released up to three times faster than 802.11ac. And what's funny about this story is um, Megan, the, the uh, woman that sits next to me, um, saw this article pop up as, as uh, Don posted that we were going to talk about it, and she said, is it bad that I didn't know that there were five Wi-Fis before this? <laughs> well, no, you're, you're in marketing. That's, that's what we're supposed to do. But uh, like, have you have you downloaded the new Wi-Fi? <laughs> you gotta, so, gotta get it. She's on it. Yeah, she's, she's ready to go. But uh, three times faster, that'd be that'd be pretty exciting. Up now, to. In her defense, though, right. remember they didn't number Wi-Fi before? Like, mm -hmm. Wi-Fi 5 is technically the first one because it was 802.11 A, B, G, N. But that's what they're saying when they're talking about the, the and first And then when they went to AC, that became Wi-Fi 5. Okay. And now 802.11 AX is Wi-Fi 6. So uh, Megan is not... Uh, she's she off the hook. not be ashamed. Yeah, she's off so, the hook on So that when one. you had a, a router that said like uh, 802.11 A slash B, so you, you basically had a 1, 2, and 3... Right. Router or whatever. They uh, just didn't call them that. Okay. Yeah, because that, that name was around. And then crazy marketing people like you got no, in and ruined sorry. it all. But now, you know, when you go to the store to buy a router, it will be a little easier. Like, hey, it's Wi Fi 6. Yeah, or it's, it's a lot 7. easier than 802.11 AC. I mean, because yeah. it tells you which is next or, or which is now, and these ones don't. Yeah, because the big problem was for the common person. If you had, like, if they did 802.11 AB, people wouldn't know is that 802.11 A. And 802.11b, or is it 802.11ab? Mm -hmm. It's all mixed together now. They kind of have a different name, but uh, three times faster than 802.11ac, which technically means nothing because if you read the standard, it never mentions speed. Uh, Intel has actually released some wireless adapters, though, that are some of the first to be officially certified, uh, and they're they're promising. Oh, I shouldn't say they're promising. They're saying that you will obviously be able to achieve speeds up to 2.4 gigabit over wireless, which is pretty good. A question. It, uh, it, let's say I, I run out and I buy a, a brand new router now that's Wi-Fi 6 um, compliant. Is, is my computer, uh, is that like a firmware upgrade? or? Oh, no. Okay. So I'd have to go get a new computer. Yeah. It's, it's what we like to call an Apple upgrade. Ah, you yes. buy a whole new computer. Yep. Awesome. <laughs> so don't run out and get, it, get the new router. It's never worth it to rush out and try and get the latest and greatest Wi-Fi that uh, over time you will slowly accumulate devices that help you migrate over. Uh, so, for example, I think it was the Galaxy Note 10 is one of the first phones to have Wi-Fi 6. Uh, the article actually has several listed somewhere in here. Um, yeah, Samsung Galaxy Note 10. Uh, there's a couple of Qualcomm cards and Intel cards that are being released. And when I say cards, these are like PCI cards for a desktop. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, they'll release like a mini PCIe card. And if you have an Apple or a Mac, uh, that doesn't help you at all. Uh, you do actually have to buy a new laptop. Uh, if you have a Windows machine, you can actually pop your old card out, pop the new one in, and potentially upgrade. So it just depends on your system whether or not you'll be able to do that. But again, it's not really worth it. If you're like really dying to get 2.4 gigahertz on wireless, I mean 2.4 gigabit over your wireless network, then maybe you could do it. But otherwise, I usually just wait and slowly new devices come out and they 
they upgrade me. All right, I'll wait. Are you waiting? Yes. Good choice. Uh, <laughs> all right. Good story. Good story. <laughs> Thanks for for your input there. Uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm glad you could. Yeah, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. you know whose input wasn't valued? The person in the next article. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, this one over at Forbes.com. Uh, Richard Stallman has resigned as president of the Free Software Foundation. So I assume, uh, you know, he he's uh, he founded this organization in '85, and um, he's he's led it to the great organization it is today, and and he's uh, retiring and stepping down and letting someone else, you know, pick up where he left off. Is that is that right? Boy, that would be a warm, <laughs> yeah. touchy feely story, Man, and it? that would be amazing. That is not what that, this that's not what's about. happening. No. Oh no, yeah. no. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, Richard Stallman, or as he's known in the open source community, RMS, uh, he's he's a bit of a strange character, you know. He, he that does... might be an understatement, Don. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's, <laughs> he's an odd one. He is an odd cat. W- when people when people call like Unix and Linux admins neckbeards, they're they're normally referring to a stereotype that's been created around Richard Stallman. Uh, but he created the original GNU toolset that is used in pretty much every Linux distribution. If you've ever used Emacs, that's a Richard Stallman thing. Uh, if you have used the GNU C compiler or GCC or anything like that, uh, those all actually GCC doesn't stand for C compiler. It's the compiler collection. GNU yeah, because it's, it's a it's a series of tools. Right. right? Um, and then some other tools associate, that we tend to associate with Linux that he also is responsible for. And then he has been a huge proponent of free and open software, and like truly free. Uh, he pushed the operating system uh, GNU Herd, uh, H-E-R-D. So uh, again, it was like a competitor kernel to Linux in the early days until Linux uh, blew it out of the water. Uh, so he's, he's a big deal in the open source community. Sounds like a great guy. Unfortunately, he has fallen into what several of the news outlets have classified as the clueless nerd. Oh. And uh, in a MIT mailing list, they were uh, the topic of uh, Jeremy Epstein had come up as as it should in an MIT technical mailing list. Yep. Uh, and he made some comments that uh, many people have interpreted as him defending Jeremy Epstein. And MIT is kind of roped into this because they're uh, I forget the, the guy, the IT director or whatever, was taking money from Jeremy Epstein. Oh, because what I what I read is he he was arguing about um, the late Marvin Minsky, an yeah. AI pioneer, uh, and one of the uh, uh, or accused of assaulting one of Epstein's victims. Okay, all right. So I'm, I might be blending two stories then. But the main thing he is may he have made defended some, more than one person here. <laughs> he made some comments on here. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. he has. Over the years, he has said some really bizarre yeah. things. Uh, <laughs> do they have other quotes from him in the article? So, so it's funny that you should bring that up because I, I'd heard some kind of varying things about was he defending Jeffrey Epstein or was he defending Minsky? Like, is it taken out of context? So I went on this interesting little rabbit hole, Ooh. and you can still get to his blogs from like 2003. So regardless of what he've done, he's done today. Um, he said some pretty interesting, <laughs> borderline <laughs> atrocious things in the previous. Like he told a story on his blog about saying something about uh, like plant-based necrophilia. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, he he was asked to leave because he was given a class when he did this at dinner. And what he had done is he would stuck dead flowers like in his nose, from what I can tell. But it was just the way he was referring to it. It was making people uncomfortable. Yeah, I'm uncomfortable. He's also been an advocate for, uh, for like, there's things about necrophilia and pedophilia and stuff on his blog. So it gets pretty strange pretty fast. Do you guys that, have necrophilia on your buzzword? Bench? It's uh, not on mine, yeah. I, but not. I, feel like I, I thought we took it off. Up. Yeah, so, yeah. So that was uh, the quote that I was looking for, as I found while Justin was talking, uh, where he was describing several uh, taboos that we have in our society, like uh, adultery, necrophilia, bestiality, possession of child pornography, and even incest and pedophilia. Uh, And his quote, so these are his actual words, uh, all of these acts should be legal as long as no one is coerced. They are illegal only because of prejudice and narrow-mindedness. So if we were a more open-minded society, we could do all sorts of crazy things, but because we're such a closed-minded society, he now has to step down from every position of leadership yeah. that he's in. Uh, so, so there we go. Um, I don't know how I feel about this. Uh, I mean, I, really? Well, <laughs> so how these are Don is stepping down from the podcast. After. <laughs> so, so obviously, I mean, he he's he did something really, really stupid, mm-hmm. and uh, and so he he needs to step down. Uh, 
there's another side of this story, which is, man, this is a big figure in the open source community that's now being kind of removed because of something he said. Shouldn't that be defended on free speech? But honestly, I, I think we'll be all right without him. I think we'll we'll make it. So from what I read, that was part of the, the, the reason for like this push because of these comments, which were in the past and current comments. It was like a pattern of behavior where people are like, ah. Yeah, if there was that old stuff and then this is still happening today, I think yeah, is what it's, the issue uh, is. I mean, you know, maybe it might be some off-color things that he's saying tongue-in-cheek and people will take them out of context. That might be the case, but I feel like there's a few topics you just don't use as a as a joke. Well, especially out on the on the interwebs? office, uh, you know, uh, mail server. Or, yeah, you know, yeah. The, the, Let me tell you. And this, you know, just... Just week before last, I think he was at Microsoft giving a talk to the Windows Subsystem for Linux people. So, uh, you know, who knows what stories he told out there? That'll be curious to see. That's exciting. <laughs> yep. He's going to go live with John McAfee, I think, now. And you wow. know, I think those two would get along great. I bet that. <laughs> I suspect <laughs> either horribly or great. They That's need a reality make, show waiting reality to happen. Show. They need to make a TV show out of that. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Fox is on it, I'm sure. Uh, all right, let's head over now to neowin.net for our next article. Mozilla launches paid premium support for enterprise customers. That's a lot of P's there. Um, this is, I feel like we've been talking about Firefox a lot in the last couple of weeks. We, I know we've talked about security and, and uh, the security that they have there. Uh, on on their browsers, but I feel like they're getting a little more more play recently. Um, so so what is this all about? You you can pay them to fix their broken stuff. Yeah, <laughs> it, it does sound How odd, nice. doesn't it? How nice of them. All right, so Mozilla is definitely getting a big upswing in the media right now. And one of the main drivers for that is how uh, Microsoft announced that their Edge browser was switching over to the Chromium backend. Uh, so it effectively becomes... Chrome, as far as a rendering engine is concerned, uh, Mozilla and Firefox, uh, they've they've kind of resisted that trend, and you know they they push towards compatibility. But it's a chance for them to swoop in and say, "Hey, are you trying to get re- get away from Chrome? You can't do it with Edge, but you can with us." And so they're getting a, a bit of an uptick on that. Uh, one area where they they lack though is a lot of organizations, especially enterprise integra- enter- enterprise organizations. Hard to say. Uh, they don't want to use Firefox because it's not it's not baked into the OS. So it's an extra thing. You've got to update. You've got to push out. If your web pages don't render right, you've got to deal with that. So there's a lot of bit different challenges for running an alternative browser. Well, Mozilla, up until recently, has always treated this as just a open source, uh, you know, free thing. They throw it out there. You can run it if you want, and that's that. Uh, but now to put enterprise support behind it, that's designed to target some of those larger organizations that that may want to try out the browser but need to know it's going to work for their business case scenario and that it will receive updates in a timely fashion and doing paid support is one way to do that. So this will get people access to the ability to submit bugs privately so that the bugs won't be out on the public trackers for other people to see. Uh, they'll be able to get security fixes, uh, a private customer portal and access to the enterprise critical issues distribution list. In other words, their features and requests and things like that will get kicked up a little higher in the queue than the regular person. So it's uh, it's Mozilla acting more like a regular company, I think. Yeah, it's about time. Do, do you use Mozilla now? Only when I'm testing. Only when you have to. Yeah, I, I, I use Chrome. I think we talked about it. We said we, yeah. we both have it on our machines too, yeah. Justin and I. But Yeah, I, I used it for a while because I was having some trouble with Chrome. Chrome went through an update. Then I started having trouble with Firefox, so I, I've been back and forth, but most of the time I just open it if I need to test an application to see how things render. Um, it does come on some Linux distributions. It's like the default one, so there's there's times where I have some at-home computers where I use it a little more. I, honestly, for me, all the browsers are really the same at this point. As long as I have bookmark sync across my platforms, I'm happy. Uh, you can't do that with Edge because if you're on a Mac, yeah, well, I guess they have Edge for Mac now, but you'd be crazy to run mm-hmm. that. Uh, wow. Yeah. With Chrome, you can run it on all the different platforms, so that's kind of nice. Uh, Firefox, I don't, can you do bookmark sync in Firefox? I think there, hmm, it doesn't work quite like the Chrome, like your different profiles and your bookmark sync. That was another sticking point for me. It was a little more involved to get all that to, to happen, so I was like, this is a lot of work. So, <laughs> so out it goes. Yep. Uh, <laughs> work is bad. 
All right. Uh, our next article, uh, speaking of, of applications here, Sophos, uh, well, this is on ZDNet, I should mention. Uh, Sophos open source sandboxy, or open source is sandboxy, a utility for sandboxing any application. Sandboxy is now a free download source code to be open sourced at a later date. And I got to say, when I looked at the, the thumbnail for this article, I thought that was just Minesweeper. Yeah, it, it's very Windows 3.1-ish, you know? Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm not sure why they, they do that. Like, whoever whoever did their diagram did it in Microsoft Paint. <laughs> they did, and, <laughs> so, and it looks great. Real high end. Looks but, great. Uh, Sandbox is kind of neat. Uh, it was an internal tool developed at Sophos that they would use to, if they had an application they thought might be a Trojan, they could fire it up inside of a sandbox and and test it and know that it wouldn't affect the underlying operating system. Uh, they had big plans for it that never really went anywhere, and so they finally reached a point where they said, you know what, let's just open source this and give it out to the community. Uh, and so that's exactly what they've done. Sandboxy is now free. Uh, the source code is not released yet, so they've released the compiled version of it, but their plan is to release the source code uh, when that happens, having a very dynamic sandbox that you can use inside of just Microsoft Windows is, is a nice thing. In Linux, we have we have things like jails that you can do and, and containers and all that. But in the Windows world, you really don't have much because Microsoft partitions a lot of that functionality away inside of the OS. But a third-party app like Sandboxy will let you do that. So great way to test applications and other things. Yeah, and even the, the screenshot that they show of their actual application there is very Windows 3.1 as well in the... I don't know. The logo makes me think of Doritos. It kind of yeah. does make me think of Doritos. I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. Subliminal messaging. Maybe that's how they're going to make their revenue. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're actually a subsidiary of Frito Lay Company. Part of Yum Brands. Why, why don't we have Doritos here? Oh, probably the, the chewing. Yeah, I'm sure everybody listening would be like, yeah. "What is Justin doing?" <laughs> Well, we could spray them with water so they were a little bit soggy. Yeah. And ah. People wouldn't know. Yeah. But then I'd you have mean, to make them garbage. <laughs> <laughs> Hot garbage. That sounds great. Uh, <laughs> another hey, by the way, yeah, uh, the, the person who wrote this, it, it's who do they work for? For Zero Day. Yes, thank you. Oh, shoot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I gave you a uh, buzzword bingo. We haven't really been big on the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all, all so far. I finally got it. Well, I haven't I, done it in so long. I know I've rattled. I, I definitely said container. That's a word. Oh, yeah, you um, did. Yeah, I don't have that. Yeah, I don't week. have that, though. Oh, you don't? Not no. on my card this week. <laughs> and I'm For not once. about to say it. I know. I, I need it. <laughs> so, to say what? <laughs> Nothing. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's head over now to our next article on techrepublic.com. JP Morgan's Athena has 35 million lines of Python code and won't be updated to Python 3 in time. So does, does that mean that, I mean, someone doesn't manually have to sit there and go through all these lines of code, or do they? Oh, yes. They do. Uh, there are some automated tools that will help do certain things. Like from Python 2 to 3, one of the biggest sticking points was the print function. It used to be a special statement, and now it's an actual function call. So you have to add parentheses. Well, there's automated tools that will do that. Uh, there's some other things like strings are handled a little bit differently. You had originally Python 2 just made it all magic. It was all strings, but some of them are now bytes. Some of them, you have to be explicit about how you're handling them. So I read this, and I go, wow, that's a lot of Python code. Somebody should get busy. Uh, They should have got busy a long time ago, though, Uh, personally. January 1st, 2020 was announced the end of date, I think, last January. Not the one that just happened, but the one before that. When you should even start before they announce the time because so, you know what's coming. One of the biggest issues for the migration from two to three was, uh, especially like J.P. Morgan, uh, the fintech industry, financial data, some of those libraries that were originally written for Python only worked in Python 2. Python 3 just kind of went, ah, we're still having some trouble. But about Python 3.5, that was no longer the case. Most of those had been migrated, and even things with C extensions were working very well. But then people go, ah, oh, well, it'll be all right. Then Guido Van Rossum was like, January 1st, 2020, it's over. No more patches, nothing. And so so that means that on that date, this application will still work. It'll but still work no because there will be a for... Python 2 runtime. But if somebody finds a catastrophic security bug, oh, well. Yeah, and this and this is a, a core uh, platform for them. This is their trading platform uh, that's at the heart of their business. So that... Uh, that's when, frightening. When you have a company that's pushing billions of dollars a day through an application like this, which J.P. Morgan certainly is, mm-hmm. then 
I think on one hand, it's easy to look at this and react and say, oh, there's no way they're going to fix it. They're going to be screwed. But the reality is they have so much money that if anybody finds a security exploit inside of Python, they can fix it themselves. And it's probably easier, cheaper in the long run for them to do that, to just pay to have Python developers continue to support it than it is for them to try and convert over. Because Python, I, Justin, I have some simple scripts here that control the, the monitors on the wall. And I had to get you to help me convert those over to Python 3 because yeah, it was dumb things. Like after a function, now you have to have a colon because. Like, I, I don't know why you just had to stick a colon there. You didn't need it before, but now you do. Yeah, and so I think we were actually doing some network stuff. And the bit or the byte string versus the regular string came because it goes, ah, oh, I blowed up. I don't know what to do. You go, oh, you just put a decode function where, call there. Where is that script? I'm going to pull up one of those scripts because it was, it was just ridiculous little things like that. But it was annoying for me on a 15-line script to get in there and update it to Python 3. So 35 so million 35 lines. Million. So That's, now I will say uh, I, there's a whole lot of Python developers, programmers, data scientists that work in fintech. I think it's been quoted like Bank of America alone employs 22,000 Python programmers. So that's wow. yeah, a, a lot of jobs. And you're probably right. Just have people fix it, right? They have a bunch of programmers, mm -hmm. got a bunch of money, have people fix it. The What I would really like, f you know, if it was my business, but if I was JP Morgan, let's be honest, I probably would be doing the same thing. Well, that'd be all right. I would like to be able to leverage the Python 3 community that is now continuing to update and maintain Python 3. 35 million lines is a whole lot of, that's a whole lot of programs. See, I, I bet Red Hat or SUSE will step in and say, we're going to continue to support it. They've, they both said they weren't, but I bet they would if there was enough money in the yeah, action. If they're getting paid for that. So I'll tell you what, if JP Morgan was like, Justin, we'll pay you to support this. But like, I, Done. How many zeros? How many zeros? <laughs> That's a lot of colons to look at. <laughs> <laughs> Enough zeros make you look at colons. <laughs> I knew the setup, but I had to give We're it gonna to make you. a shirt out of that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, We're gonna add colon to our buzzword bingo. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Uh, <laughs> what are we putting in the wrong kind of articles? Uh, <laughs> I just need somebody to say this. I don't <laughs> We don't even need to talk about the article, but from Proc Proctology Weekly. Uh, we <laughs> All right, no, our next article is actually over on Wired.com, which is telling me I have three free articles left this month. Good to know. I didn't know they're going to uh, to the uh, gate format here. So, uh, 281 alleged email scammers arrested in massive global sweep. The most sweeping takedown yet of so-called BEC scammers involved arrests in nearly a dozen countries. So, what are BEC scammers? Uh, oh, shoot. I, I know what it stands for. Business. Oh, crap. Well, I, I, all right. Uh, you get these emails all the time. Uh, we've seen them in IT Pro TV where yeah. you get an email that says, you know, oh, hey. Business email compromise. There we go. Business email compromise. So you get an email and it says, you know, it, hey, it's me, Bob, the CEO, and I need you to send me uh, or, or contact me as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. Or I need you to send me 10 Apple gift cards for blah, blah, blah. I need you to wire funds to here or there that they're emails that are basically phishing, except they're not trying to get information from you. They're just trying to get you to do a quick wire transfer. Mm -hmm. And as ridiculous as these are, we laugh about them, delete them. I usually play around with the people and ask them, you know, are, are 10 gift cards enough? Should I send 20 so you don't have to ask twice? And uh, you got to have some fun with it. Um, uh, I think the last one I got, I went back and forth with him four or five times before I called him an a-hole, and then he stopped responding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, but uh, but these scams go on all the time, and the, it, people fall for it, right? Uh, they uh, arrested 281 million people, seized Two, almost— 281 million people? Sorry, 281 people seized almost oh. $3.7 million. Okay. Sorry, that's what <laughs> they arrested right. all yeah. of <laughs> India. All of it. Actually, uh, like— Seventy-five like percent of the United States population. Yeah, they were all arrested. Yeah. So arrested two hundred eighty-one people. One hundred and sixty-seven of them from Nigeria. Like when mm. people make jokes about Nigerian email scams, it's based on fact. Like most email scams come from Western Africa. It's just they've perfected it apparently, and uh, and that's how it goes. Well, or the governments really aren't doing anything on their end to crack down. Or the governments are sponsoring it. Yeah. Okay. So, you Fair know, enough. a lot of that's a, a possibility. Uh, but they said in here, somewhere in the article, they say how much it's cost businesses. Uh, it's in the billions of dollars, billion, though. Right there? Uh, it was? There, more than 12 billion worldwide. Uh, well, yeah, the 3.7 million they seized. Well, 
make a big dent. Yeah, that's next to nothing. Because that's how percentages work. I believe that's how math works. <laughs> uh, BM, same thing. It's whatever. Move the decimal over, right? Yeah. See, when I read the Nigeria <laughs> thing, I was like, this has to be a fake article. This can't pop. Like, it just seems ridiculous, but apparently not. Was it, it the whole real. royal family? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But Especially with all the tragedy they've gone through. We're just transferring the funds. It's not like they're stealing, right? Yeah. I mean, just get, they got to yeah, get I, out of the country. I, I gave it to them. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> those are those are called what, like five hundred eight scams? Or they have a number. Oh, really? Yeah, I didn't know that. Because uh, it's covered under some. Oh, like the statute that yeah that addresses because that's how many billions of dollars people have given. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, let me see if I can find the number. It's uh, like it's I thought five hundred eight, but I might be wrong. Looks like I am wrong because five weights not coming up, but yeah, those uh, those have been going on ever since the internet started, <laughs> just a long, long time. But the ones targeting businesses have been way more successful because they'll do things like just send you an invoice, and the larger yeah. the company, more likely they are to just pay it without question. Yep. One well, of the ones that scare me, the ones we were talking about last week with the deep fakes, where they'll they'll actually call now and sound like and the sound CEO. sound like someone, and we'll, and we'll talk a little bit more uh, in our interview about some of these too with StridePoint because. Uh, they're kind of on the the cutting edge of some of this stuff, or uh, also just catching people <laughs> with uh, with the easy ones, I think. So, um, but first, a couple more articles. This one from thehackernews.com: New SIM card flaw lets hijackers hijack any phone just by sending an SMS. This kind of reminds me of that uh, that old FaceTime one where they could call you, and even if you didn't answer, they'd get access to your camera and stuff. So, um, so I can just uh, have someone. Uh, well, they're calling it sim jacking. That's yes, that's pretty cool. I like uh, that. So th this one's pretty bad, and oh, okay. but it's uh, a cool name. Yeah, <laughs> it is a cool name. Uh, remember, remember in the olden days when you had a CPU in your computer, like an Intel Pentium or an AMD Opteron or whatever, mm -hmm. and it was just a CPU, and you didn't have to worry about the security of that processor. And then all of a sudden, we learned about Management Engine and how there's an entire computer inside your processor. Oh, and it has a security vulnerability, and you're screwed because you can't update it. Right? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, processors suck. Well, now we're having that moment with SIM cards and phones. Remember the olden days when SIM cards just had your mobile account number tied to it, and that was it? Well, it turns out there's basically a computer inside of your SIM card, or at least a series of instructions that are stored on it that your phone is hard-coded to execute by default. So it is effectively a computer at that point. Well, it turns out security on that is not so good. And attackers have found a way to be able to craft commands that they can text to your phone. That your phone, in just based on its hardware design, sends those commands to the SIM card, and the SIM card executes them, performing some kind of operation. And this is all part of a SIM card toolkit that many, many cell phone uh, networks use. And it enables them to do a whole lot of things. They list them in the article. Uh, they can get your, your device's location. They can get your IMEI number. Uh, they can send fake messages on your behalf. They can perform premium rate scams because they can actually dial toll numbers. Uh, so they can set up a 1-900 number and call it. Uh, they can uh, spy on your surroundings because they can have it actually call them and they can start to listen in. I don't know if there's any way to do camera. Uh, they can pop open a browser and have it go to a link. That link might go to a site that embeds a Trojan. Uh, they can do all sorts of other things, like mess with the SIM card to disable it, thus making it where you can't use your phone. And they can pull other data about your phone. And they can do all this without you knowing about it, because when they send you a text, the phone recognizes it's an instruction and just bl blindly assumes that it's the phone company doing work and sends it right to the SIM card to be executed. Can they make it play a tone that will make me want to attack the other people around me? He's that's the Air the Manchuria of, candidate. Well, it's the plot of the Kingsman, too. Oh. Uh, I, I just see Denzel in my head now. Oh, yeah. yeah. I imagine they could do that. Well, like Naked Gun, didn't, didn't that yeah. happen, too? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was a Naked Gun. Yeah. If, if they could have it place a phone call, and they were playing that tone on the other end of the call, yeah. then here you go. You got your golden circle or whatever. Samuel L. Jackson is finally coming for us. <laughs> <laughs> We we knew it would happen. With snakes on the phone. Yeah. I think that's a different film. <laughs> <laughs> so this one's bad. Uh, what makes it worse? Guess what you can do about it? Um, nothing. Good guess. <laughs> yeah. I nothing. win. Uh, there's absolutely nothing. Rip my phone in half. Uh, we as end users can do Does, about it. Are, do they make any phones that have do not have SIM cards nowadays? No. Oh. Uh. No, I mean, well, now, there's some that have the digital SIM, 
like some of the iPhones where the SIM is basically embedded on the phone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for Verizon but, with or for a while with Verizon, you couldn't change the SIM card and couldn't access yeah. it. I know in the AT and T ones, you but could. it still functions the same way. Yeah. And it's even worse because now you can't swap <laughs> yeah. it out, right? That's um, the whole phone you got to throw out. So what has to happen is the phone companies, most of them have already started doing this have to look for those text messages and filter them to prevent people from sending SIM toolkit commands via text. So we're reliant on the phone companies to protect us from this, and they've done a bang-up job of that over the years, so I am sure we'll be fine. <laughs> I can't no, tell no, fine. That, Perfect. Yeah. I, I can't tell if that's sarcasm or oh, not. I'm, I'm confident. I, just, I feel great. I feel the great The people about my at phone. Cricket Wireless uh, <laughs> have, a, have a team right now. Yeah. If Re- Boost Mobile can't solve it, nobody yeah. can. So these SMS messages, will I ever see this? Nope. Oh, because you, your phone, it, it's it's it just kind of intercepts someone goes ah. built into the hardware that this is not something a human sees. Send it to the SIM card. That's rude. I didn't know my phone did that. Oh, yeah. Your phone does a lot of stuff you don't know about. I might throw my phone out in my car with it on the yeah. way home today. All right. Fantastic. <laughs> um, that's a real downer because there's normally at the end and Don goes, but, uh, you know, they they knew about this ahead of time. And so they've released a patch well, and yeah. it's on your device hey. now. Don't worry about it. Your cellular provider has you covered. Just trust AT and T is what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. I, if there's one thing I've learned over the years, AT and T's got your back. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like massive telecommunication corporations always have you in their heart. Well, I'm sure the FCC. Um, you know. You mean Verizon? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. The FCC is basically being compromised by Verizon. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> BS award everybody gets the you know the JD Powers yeah JD Powers and Associates <laughs> premier golden corp of the decade uh-huh. century whatever it's like they all get it though right yeah yeah, yeah everybody, like, I, how I, did you all get best phone I'm gonna go on eBay and buy one of those I can just have it back there like I got the award <laughs> yeah. Oh, that'd be, that would look nice. Next no, I'm Bob. curious. Are they on eBay? <laughs> Can, yeah, I can you get, get a JD, JD Power and Associates Well, as you're, as you're looking that up, let me uh, <laughs> let me tell you a little bit about our next article. Uh, this one is over on ArsTechnica.com. Uh, a bad Iowa campaign. Check the scope. Pen testers nabbed, jailed in Iowa courthouse. Break in attempt. Iowa court officials authorized quote various means to check county court security. Um, I, I mean, I, I guess they're just happy that they didn't get shot on sight. Uh, I suppose. <laughs> I, don't, so, I don't. Do you like? I mean, get, I'm happy that I get and get shot on the side, but I don't know if that's. I'm still pretty sad that I'm in prison. All right. So when I when or I, jail, excuse me. <laughs> when I uh, get a contract, so let's say you hire me to pen test your company, and you know that that that's going to include some physical pen testing as well. Do you give me some sort of letter? So of that's, immunity. That's the tr- apparently from what I understand. There was a horrible communication breakdown. Yeah. And the scope was super vague. Mm. And so they were like, cool, physical infiltration seems like it might be on the table. No one told someone at the court, and they were like, no. Well, well we didn't tell know them, they were going to do them physical. At the court, then- <laughs> well, no, someone's yeah. supposed to know, so you can mm. contact them. You're supposed to have a get-out-of-jail-free letter, uh, which is actually – so if they didn't have that, that that's also kind of on them. On them. Yeah. Uh, I would not be doing things like that if I didn't have my get-out-of-jail-free letter. Yep. So, uh, so what basically happened is the uh, Iowa State Court, so at the state level – uh, ordered these pen tests, right? And one pen test was supposed to be carried out against the Dallas County Courthouse, right? So this is which state- looks haunted if you look at the photo. It could be. I mean, it looks to me. I mean, like it's got the of- what was it from Ghostbusters Two, the Spinelli Brothers yes. or whatever. And I gave up the chair. <laughs> <laughs> so it does look creepy. It's like yeah, Adam's family I, house. I would not go there. All right. So so anyhow, uh, the state ordered the pen test over this local or county courthouse. And uh, they ordered a pen test. And what they were expecting was a digital pen test of their computer systems. Well, the pen testers went a step further and said, let's see if we can get it records by actually getting inside of the building. They waited till nighttime. And the article is a little unclear that whether or not they went in the third floor or whether they went in the bottom and went up to the third floor. But basically, they were found roaming around on the third floor. Uh, a silent arm was triggered. Police were dispatched, and they were arrested. The, uh, the local courthouse didn't know that pen testing was ordered at all, uh, is, is my understanding. But then at the state level, they said, we didn't know they were going to do a physical pen test. We thought they were just testing computer systems. And they refused to drop the charges. Oh. So the guys stayed in prison, and they had to uh, post bail. They, they were in, they, uh, 
I said prison. You differentiated jail. Yeah, jail. So when I think I of jail, I think of like temporary holding that before pre- you're like transferred. But that may be a regionality thing. I'm mm-hmm. just going to assume they're both unpleasant. Yes. <laughs> you don't want to sure. be They either. are similar facilities that house criminals. Yeah. They were... Uh, <laughs> They Both have locks there. and yeah. bars yeah. and, and yeah. angry people. Yeah. So uh, so they were in there for at least a day and a half uh, because they didn't take care. Like, as an amateur, you can't just one day say, you know what, I'm going to be a pen tester. Mm-hmm. Like, you actually have to learn crap to be a pen tester. And one of those things you learn is that you need a scope, a statement of work that says, here's what I'm going to do. And it needs to be signed by both parties. And law enforcement needs to know about it. You're actually supposed to call ahead. Like that police department should have known that a physical break in attempt was going to happen at the courthouse. You're not testing the police response. Mm-hmm. You're testing Whether the building. Whether they identify yeah. that you are in there. Right. Or e- either an electronic means or a physical means. And that's actually what they, they got. They got in trouble for burglary. Right? So yeah, yeah, and uh, I just assumed that these were two amateurs, like just two people posing as pen testers. It does say that they're employees of Coal Fire. Now I'm not familiar with Coal Fire, so I don't know if they are uh, big or small or, or what. It could just be two guys who created a company called Coal Fire. But on the uh, on their homepage, there are pictures of skyscrapers, uh, oh. which you know obviously they're they're such a big company. They're in all these skyscrapers. That doesn't look like stock photo. Pretty at sure all. that's yeah. Seattle. Yeah. No, uh, no, that's not Seattle. <laughs> Anyhow, no, it's um, sunny. So you you can't really tell when you look at this stuff. Uh, are they are they a big company? Or are they not? But they say that uh, they have over fifteen hundred employees, done over two thousand assessments. Sounds like a big company. They should have known better. So I don't know where the breakdown was on this one, but it's uh, it's a pretty big breakdown. So having some like wiggle room in the sky, like being very vague. Okay, I can see the misunderstanding there. But the fact that they were like, yeah, we don't know who to call. We don't have a letter saying that we're supposed to do this. Oops. Also, we have these lock picks that now, since they've been committed as part of a crime, add additional charges to the things that I have. Yeah, I, I'm going to start trying this, though. Like, if you ever get pulled over, be like, oh, you got me. Okay, so that pen test did not work. And, uh, <laughs> doing a great job, officer. Those new radar guns are good. Yeah. What, what did you get me at? You, uh, 98? Yeah, that's what I had, too. Okay. Check that off. <laughs> My favorite was they had to go before the judge in the same courthouse. Oh, they were so already there. I'm yeah. wondering, like, when the police were escorting him in, they just said, no, no, we, we know the way. It's all yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, you, that back door locks wicked easy to pick on it. You should probably get that checked out. That's well, a pro tip. I, well, would you say that they uh, that, that the, the courthouse passed or failed the pen test? Because, I mean, they got in. They well, didn't get out. It, did they get any records? Uh, yeah. Right? Because who cares if they get in? You know, if they couldn't get in any of the data, then it's a pass. I, I say it's a pass. You know, they, they set off the alarm. I mean, they're, yeah. they were in jail. I think I think they passed. That counts. Yeah. yeah. It, what's the Sylvester Stallone movie where he tests jails? The um, escape plan or something like that? Is it, it is escape plan, escape yeah. Escape plan, yeah. Is that they made a part two? They did. Yeah. They did. Phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is phenomenal. Yeah, that's disappointing. Um, Google but, auto completes with a part three here if you type what? in. Are they working on it or is it out? But I don't know if it's coming out. Yeah. It was an escape plan. It was Sylvester Stallone and, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. And Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Jim Caviezel. Yeah. And 50 yep. Cent. And Benny Joe. Yeah, 50 Cent. Yeah. And the daughter was somebody famous, too. I can't remember who she was. Uh, Anyhow, uh, yeah. Great, great film. Um, by the way, um, looked up J.D. Power Awards on uh, eBay. Closest I found was a... Uh, WWJD, a what would Jesus do pin? <laughs> um, so, no. Um, but maybe they've all just sold recently, but uh, just keep an eye out. If you do have one uh, that you're not using, uh, please share that with us. We I'm love, in the market. We'd yep. love to have it on the set. <laughs> I uh, also looked and I could not find. Really? I found yeah. some like small pins. Yeah, and small, stuff, yeah like lapel pins yeah. that you could get. But, but not the actual award. Yeah, I want, I want oh, the wait. best in class award. No. I did a uh, oh no these are just similar okay I, I did a, a search for auctions that were closed and mm. so there's some that are, are very similar to the award you can get a knockoff this one's the uh, the voice of the chamber award the, so, the J B awesome. Power Award <laughs> <laughs> a lot easier so if anybody says we're hijacked I'm like actually Justin Dennison that's J D Power <laughs> that's what I'm saying 
<laughs> JD Power. Yeah. All right. <laughs> hey, uh, let's switch gears now and uh, and make room because we're gonna we're gonna test uh, the fire marshal here. And we're gonna we're gonna bring in uh, two additional people: Todd Snap, uh, President of Stride Point, Nathan Caldwell, uh, a secure culture or the secure culture evangelist at Stride Point, uh, and we're gonna talk all about pen testing and and how you avoid situations like what uh, what we just heard about over in Iowa. But uh, we're gonna do that in just a second, so stay tuned. We've got more Technado coming up right after this. Enjoying Technado? Then be sure to check out Ignite, another podcast from the Pro TV Network. Ignite highlights stories of leadership as host Vicki Guy interviews a new business person each week. Learn more at itpro.tv slash podcasts. All right, welcome back to Technado, and we are, uh, I think, trying to break the rules here with the fire marshal, seeing how many people uh, we can fit into Don's office. We learned the other day that uh, we can now uh, we can accommodate 16 microphones uh, through the mixer <laughs> in this room, so we're taking steps there. We're not going to jump right in, so uh, we've invited two people up to our office all the way from, from Tampa, right? Tampa? That's right. Yeah. Yep. And so we have the guys from Stride Point here today. We have Todd Snap and Nathan Caldwell. How are you guys doing? Doing good. Doing Thanks great. for having us. Yeah, thank you. All right, and we just learned, uh, Todd, you are the president of Stride Point, and Nathan, you are a secure culture evangelist, or the secure culture. I don't know how many. Yeah, the, the, the. We paid <laughs> extra only. for the extra secure word in the title, yes. That's fantastic. Well, uh, for those that aren't familiar with Stride Point, uh, why don't you give us a little bit of background? Sure. Um, well, we are a, a security company, and we have a unique approach. We are really a low-tech hacking type company. In uh, 2004, we started as a .NET development shop, and that's really what we were going to be. And the first application we developed was an LMS just to do training. We did a lot of compliance and security training, but one of our customers on training was Verizon. And right around then, Paris Hilton had her phone hacked. Do y'all remember when that happened? Yeah. Her phone got hacked. I, I mean, maybe. I yeah. <laughs> yeah. You I remember where I was. Say, yeah. Yep. <laughs> I'll bet you didn't think Paris Hilton was going to come up today. No, that's not in our uh, yeah, it's not But when after that was hacked at T-Mobile, Verizon came to us and said, hey, listen, we think you know, y'all teach security. Could you see if we're vulnerable to that? Could you try and hack us with social engineering and that type of thing? And we, of course, as a new company, said, yes, absolutely, we can do that. And we were so successful hacking them uh, with their permission, uh, we decided that was a direction we wanted to go. And so that was the, really from 2004 until now, we focused on low-tech hacking, what we call the human firewall, and preparing people for that type of an attack. I think this is the first interview we've done where the company was inspired like and created because of Paris Hilton. Yeah, we had a couple. Uh, <laughs> I thought your goal with Verizon. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there were a couple of Nicole Richie companies yeah, that we yeah, talked to. Those are all over this the place. First, yeah, Paris Hilton one. Um, <laughs> so, so we've had uh, a company. I wouldn't say come in, but uh, contracted with IT Pro TV before that basically did like a phishing email to all yeah. of our staff. Uh, one of those, just like the ones you see all over the place with, you know, I, I need you to um, reauthenticate your email or something like that. And it, it was a test to see who in the office um, would do that. Is that the kind of thing you guys do? Or it sounds like a little bit more social engineering. It's both. I mean, we do the phishing side of it, but there's more to it than that. Yeah, if you... Uh if you think about the human side of security, like any place that a social engineer or somebody could interact with a human and get them to reveal too much information or sensitive information, like that's where the real danger lies because a lot of people can focus really hardcore on their technology and their hardware and their software and make sure that that's locked down, right? But then you get somebody on the phone or you get somebody through a phishing email or uh, dropping off a USB and they plug that in and you have that human element that comes into play where they get the right information and then they can enter the proper way with the proper credentials and no alarms, no bells, no whistles go off and then they can take everything without anyone know, knowing it's in it then it's too late so so how much of of the problem is uh people just have access to things they don't need to have access to in the company because i feel like that's part of it if if you're able to hey we, we successfully successfully fished the office manager yeah. and now we can access the billing system you know you, you maybe shouldn't be able to get through that to that from from that employee well, you're exactly right access controls have a lot to do with this that you don't want the wrong people to have a high level of access the problem is that when you deal with a contact center or you even deal with frontline or even a, a, an it help desk those are people that have to have access so for example a contact center they have to have access to customer accounts 
And so being able to get personal information, uh, private information, um, or even resetting passwords, that type of a thing, is something that can be done with frontline employees uh, that maybe it's not too much access, but it's the access that they have to have to do their job. I'm curious, like, what do you guys find the average hit rate on this stuff is? Like, when you fire out a phishing email or you start making calls, what what percentage of success do you see? And I, I know I'm sure it varies from company to company, but just kind of on average, what are you getting? I, I love the word success, too. Like, it's, well, it's success, success for, for you. Them. Yeah, yeah. We like, never know what, what percentage of total failure <laughs> do you see at the company. We And we have problems with that, too. We don't know if us infiltrating is success or failure, but... Um, Sadly, it is between 30 and 35 percent. Wow. And uh, when we make phone calls, it's between 30 and 35 percent. Uh, emails are slightly less, but it's in that it's in that range. And it's it's a scary number. Does it go in line with how you'd expect um, based on department? I mean, I, I would think that, you know, if you're if you're calling into a company that has a help desk like that, maybe some of those employees might be a little more uh, aware of, of the kinds of things that are out there versus someone in the accounting department or on the sales staff or something like that. Well, what we find is uh, you might take the accounting department by surprise because they aren't used to a lot of outside calls coming in, right, uh, compared to a help desk. Uh, but on the help desk, they are trained to be helpful. And so their first inclination is, I don't want to say no to this person. I don't want them to be upset with me. I want to do a good job. And especially in contact centers, uh, that is the highest priority is getting a good rating on your interaction with that person. It's not at yeah. all the help desk I've called. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they're supposed to be. Yeah, they're supposed yeah. to be. Yeah. But Nathan's exactly right that uh, the customer service mentality is important, but it has to be joined up with a secure culture or it, it can be dangerous. Um, and so it, if you go department by department, certainly your front line, your, um, your, customer help desk, but we find the IT help desk, even the technical folks sometimes have a false sense of security or maybe even arrogance about it where they're not susceptible. And social engineers know that and they might might use that against them. So we've been talking about emails and phone calls, but really important question. Do y'all wear costumes? Do y'all dress up? <laughs> Uh, just in our personal like lives. Fletch. <laughs> yeah. 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 Is there any physical, uh, yeah. you know, the, uh, pen testing? The, like, you know, put on yeah. a fake nose or anything like that? Yeah. I mean, not it's, not as extreme as that, but uh, we d we have done the, the physical testing. Like, uh, you have that story where you guys went in through the parking garage entrance. Yeah, and that's the thing is you we have places where maybe we don't wear a costume or maybe the costume is just uh, looking like you're a, a guy that works on the air conditioning. And that's a big one where if you carry a ladder with you and go into a company, they'll just start opening doors for you so that you can change the air filters. Um, or in some cases, we went to a company that had locked down every entrance except through the gym. And if you went through the gym, all you had to do was write something on a piece of paper the sign-in sheet, and you went into the company. And so it's all about, um, first of all, it's about having guts. It's You have to be able to just give it a shot and have the, uh, have the guts to try it. And sometimes it might require you looking a particular way, but dressing up like a Marvel character may not be exactly what we would do. I, I think it's funny how everybody went that way. Like, yeah, I had a bright purple suit on with a feather and a cane, and uh, they let me ride in. Yeah, yeah. I was like... People might be less likely to interact with you because they assume you're insane. <laughs> That's true. This, this That's is true. possible. So what did you write in the gym sign and she just pwned? Uh, Donald Duck <laughs> is what I, the time I went in. But it was just pretty much all they all that they need to see you do is that you wrote on that piece of paper. And you just have to kind of find the outlets. It's, it is – there are places where security is, is focused and then other places where people just don't think about it. You know, the, there's the classic where – People are out smoking, and if you go smoke with them, then you're going to be able to go in that door with them, and they'll use their card to, to buzz you in. For some reason, I feel like we're just part of a Stanley Milgram experiment, <laughs> right? The, the experiments on authority. Yeah. Um, so you're just like, I am coming in here now. If I stand up now, yeah. will you all stand up? Is no. Is it one of those? No. Well, it's a, it, is a, it is about con artistry. Yeah. I mean, that's, it, it's, it's being a con man and gaining confidence, or at least acting with confidence, and you'd be amazed what that gets you. Yeah, and it's not as tricky as like we build up in our minds, right? The average person is thinking, oh, you have to have like multiple passports and all these secret identities. Accents. You gotta be like a stinking Jason Bourne. But it doesn't <laughs> take much. Like these people, the people who are pretending to be somebody they're not to gain access to a place they shouldn't, they could just walk in 
and then when they're stopped, just say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know where I'm supposed to be going. Can you help me? Well, what are you looking for? I, I'm not sure. Uh, and just thinking on their feet, being able to adapt can get them into the right places because just on average, a human being is not looking to be suspicious of others. You're trying to be helpful to others and you end up letting people in. So this seems like a weird departure from the original dot net shop, right? You think yeah. developers were good, and then now we're con artists. Is that really all? The, like you just need to be confident, or are maybe there that's other what a dot net developer really is. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, that's about it. And, but it comes from it. That comes from a small business wanting to sign deals, and that's what it comes down to. And so we said, you know what? When we talk about social engineering, uh, people answer our calls. And when we send an email saying that we're experts on social engineering, we get appointments. And so, like, for example, uh, that happened with the, the IRS. That's one of our customers that we can talk about. Uh, the IRS hired us. We sent them a letter in the mail, and the CIO of the IRS called us because their inspector general found that to be a problem, and they needed it tested. So it is kind of like that where we just decided there was opportunity, and as a small business, we found the road. And how are companies engaging with you? Because if you come in and test one time, you know, you might hit 30% of the people and then they go and educate, whatever, but then they hire new people, people leave. So how, how often do you do that kind of testing? Well, we have some companies that have hired us for 10, 12 years in a row. And the goal is that we set a benchmark and then every year we want to demonstrate how they do. And so it might be that we're sending emails and, and making calls to their contact center. And they just always want to, because of turnover at a contact center, you have to test it every year. And sometimes it's that they do training and they want to see how well it worked. Uh, in other cases, maybe we even provide training and they want to see, is this changing the, the culture? Um, so hopefully that answers your question, but it really comes down to that companies want to know every year how we doing. And this might be a dumb question, but does it get better? Like, I, obviously you guys are effective at what you do, but end users aren't typically effective. <laughs> and so, so is it 30% year after year, or do you find that once people have been through a single test, that's it, they don't usually get hit again? Or um, it's, That's almost never the case. It really is a <laughs> roller coaster. I would say that um, because of turnover and just because of the changes in the methods used, the types of, uh, of attacks. The ty and so our pen tests are really about following the, the market, you know, what's happening in the criminal world. And so we find that it goes up and down. So one year they do well and it's, oh, we got down to 19%. Oh, this is a 38% year. And, and it all comes down to just following the threats. The other thing I would add, it also depends on if a company makes it a part of their culture, right? If there is adoption by the people to say, I will reject the status quo and we will go out of our way to be more secure. That's okay that I have to change my password every 90 days and make sure it's not on a post-it note and make sure I'm not giving it to people or making it predictable like spring 2019, then summer 2019. Like if people adopt it as part of their culture and understand that they are then a part of the solution and actually protecting their business, uh, then we find a better adoption rate. We find more, way more success that way. So, so do you go with like the carrot or the stick uh, approach? Because I'm wondering, like, do you do you call out somebody and say, uh, "All right, we did this test, and Don Pazette clicked on the link and and did this," or or do you just say, "Hey, we had a 30 percent." you know, let, let's uh, focus maybe on this department or something like that. It's part of our rules of engagement. That's a very common question. They're like, do you get people fired every time? Yeah. And I would say for the most part, it's hard for us not to say. They Here's... get themselves fired. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way you think Don't on that. Yourselves. That helps my conscience <laughs> a little bit. But it does come down to the fact that, that when we do the test, we have to demonstrate that we were successful or that we could have been. And in some cases, we send them an email that goes to a fake website that we've created where they have to enter credentials. And so we'll, of course, hash that out and we'll make sure we, we don't have that, we don't possess it, but we know who did it. And usually the spirit of the engagement is that they're saying we're trying to educate. We're not trying to find the, the dumb people and fire them. We're trying to educate those people. And we found that for the most part, unless someone commits a, and we have lots of stories about some heinous things, but unless somebody does something very negligent, it's not going to affect them. Well, you know, let's, let's go for the, not necessarily <laughs> heinous, but like, what's, I was like, what was he the most, brought it on. Yeah, like, what was the most egregious thing, like the, the, the weakest security you've encountered so far? 
I would say um, maybe not the weakest, but there were situations where, for example, we were trying to get into a VPN. That's always what we want is we want to get uh, the VPN credentials. We want to be able to because that's the whole point of hacking is be able to get the not only the client, but the credentials. And we've had times where we didn't have the actual client and we needed somebody to give us that or let us download it. And the only thing they had was a CD, so we said, well, we'll give them a, a name and have them leave it at the front desk of a hotel. They'll mail it to a hotel and put it at the front desk for us. And so we had one client that uh, sent us a pre-configured VPN client on a CD, and we picked it up in a FedEx envelope at the front desk of a local hotel. And then uh, we brought it back, and we had an issue because we needed to have the IP, and we needed to put in a particular IP. So we called, and we just started calling around phone you know, phone calling salespeople that we knew used the VPN client. We got one guy who we talked to a little bit and we were saying, hey, could you just bring yours up? We think yours isn't working properly. Could you go and look at your configuration and read me that IP address there and uh, make sure it's the right one? And while we were doing that, he said, um, yeah, I'm not, I don't know if I'm supposed to give you that. And, he, and we said, well, that's okay. I mean, if you're not comfortable. And he said, um, do you really work for ABC company? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and uh, he said, okay, I just had to be sure. You, you have to tell me if you're a cop, right? Yeah. And that's yeah. the so, rules. And Part of me would want to go, yeah. no, I do not. So you can see how all those pieces come together where we get all the little pieces, and when they come together, we've got VPN access, we've got the credentials, and nobody's really going to know we were there unless um, they see the, you know, the outcome of what we do. Wow. And uh, obviously, this is a growth industry, right? So many, many companies are recognizing they need to be proactive in this. So you guys are uh, just book solid growing like crazy, or you stick with a certain client base? Well, we do some vertical, but I would say we're, we're in a growth pattern right now. And we're trying, we're really trying to uh, bring some new technology to it, because it's not just about awareness. It's not just about testing. It's about trying to build that culture. And I think there's, it, there's some growth, really, that we're finding in that. Yeah. And so right now, like uh, what we're offering is uh, a lot of the testing to see where people's weaknesses are. So through social engineering calls, through the um, the spam emails and phishing emails, uh, and then also building custom trainings for companies and issuing those trains, and then also coaching people on how to lead their teams uh, with those trainings and adopt that secure culture. So is there anything that, that's new that you've seen out in the wild in the sense of, you know, I, I get the calls from my mom, hey, I just want to make sure, is this is this one legit? And I'll say, mom, did you mouse over the email address and you see how it's not what it says? So I maybe have that false sense of security, like the help desk people you were talking about yeah. that, well, I've seen this before a hundred times, so I, I know what it is. But what's what's new? What are what are hackers doing now that, that maybe can catch us off guard? It's interesting that it's not necessarily more technically advanced sometimes it's just more diabolical and so we I heard of one the other day where what they were doing was calling a person and saying hi I'm from your credit card company uh, we need to make sure we get your account secured let me get a specialist on the line and then we can get uh, make sure we get your information and then they'll call the actual credit card company and make a three-way call and then sit on the line and listen to you tell them your credentials and so it's, it's not new technology. It's just a, a, a kind of a smart new way where they're now listening to you tell them all of your security question answers, all of the details, so that they can then call in and impersonate you. And that's one I hadn't heard about until just the last few months. i got to make a phone call. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to write jokes on them. I can't remember my security <laughs> question <laughs> answers. <laughs> uh, is this something that you see is, is very highly specific to regions? So come from... The southern part of Virginia tends to be less technologically advanced. Do you see that there's regional differences uh, for companies, or is it f pretty much 30, 33 mm -hmm. percent all across the board? Well, what it is is the bad guys don't care about where you are. What they care about is can I have success? And if somebody is too savvy and doesn't fall for it, they're picking up the phone, they're making the next call because they don't care about their success rate. They care about just getting the success. And then once they have it, they can package it up, they can sell it. And there's always a buyer. So that's the that's the other myth that people uh, mistake, like the region where you're from or, well, who would want my data? 
I'm not a celebrity. They don't want the photos on my phone. I'm not a celebrity. They don't want access to my account or I don't run the business. So why, why would I care about them getting into my account? I'm not worried about it. Right. And that's where though they don't understand that they are not evaluating you and saying, Hmm, you only have $3,000 in your account. I'll move on. They don't care about that. They want to get your information and then sell it to somebody else. And there isn't that uh, markup of trying to sell someone on the black market to purchase your items. Here's an interesting thing about regional is that we've started to do some testing of uh, call centers in India. And that is a little bit new where they are somewhat unaware that 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 there haven't been people doing a lot of testing and training, uh, even though there's a lot of call centers in India. There is maybe a cultural um, uh, lack of knowledge there that we're trying to educate. Well, yeah, Southern hospitality, though, too. I mean, if someone says please yeah. when they're asking for my password. <laughs> so you're I'm... telling me my Social Security number has not been deactivated <laughs> and there's not <laughs> cops coming. Well, bless your heart. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm curious. You, know, you, got, you guys are the, the fake bad guys. The, we, can, we can hire you to be the fake bad guys to test things out. But do you have any insight on who the, the real bad guys are? Who, who are the, the actors in this space that are trying to get at this data? Uh, they are usually international. Um, there, are, there aren't a lot of them because of, you know, there are at least decent laws uh, in the U.S., but usually they are international, and it is all about capturing data. It is all about getting data that they can package up and sell. It has value, and there's a market there that is, is not uh, locked down as much, and so uh, I would say usually it is that, or it is sometimes it's personal. Sometimes it is people who are uh, just trying to get into uh, an account. Like for example, we worked with a big um, gaming company that does uh, gaming consoles, and they were getting hacked because people have wallets. People have you know if you can figure out how to hack those accounts, uh, then some of them really just want to get. Uh, gear in games it's amazing how many you know of course the gaming community and hacking community overlap quite a bit and so that's the kind of thing it can be very different there's a wide range of of sources of that well i know that uh, companies are basically constantly under attack right now and it's sometimes state actors sometimes just random you know the automated tools are kind of pushing out and and hitting everybody so it's a a thing that we're under just a constant deluge Mm -hmm. so services like yours help with that Mm -hmm. right you know we get one step but it's really just kind of one piece of the puzzle Mm -hmm. right because then there's still the the aspect of what if somebody actually does get in now you got to remediate you have Mm -hmm. to evaluate the damages and so on so do you focus just on that space of testing the organization or do you do things beyond like remediation incident response and so on we definitely um, deal with inc- incident response and remediation. Our focus is on the preparation. Uh, it is about authentication. It is about um, policies and procedures and training. It is just making sure the people uh, become a defense. And that's what we feel like because there are a lot of good companies that provide technical defenses, and that is essential. But then helping your people defend against the other side is, is our focus, even though we do help with incident response as well. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. We talk, uh, I'm, I'm on our, our marketing team here, so we talk about how we're all, you know, brand ambassadors and, and we're all part of that. And, you know, we're basically saying here, we're all also part of the IT team. We're part of the yeah. security team because everyone that has access uh, is someone that can be uh, exploited potentially. So yeah. uh, if, if someone wants to, to find out more, do you guys just work with people in, in the geographical area of, uh, uh, in Tampa or are you guys all over the place? We are um, U.S. and have some international customers. So I would say that uh, anywhere is really uh, where we would be interested so what's the what's the best place to reach out to you guys find out more information? Yeah, our website is stridepoint s t r i d e p o i n t dot com, and uh, that's where you can contact us. And uh, uh, certainly, I would say Nathan as well. In Caldwell at stridepoint dot com is a great guy to reach out to that can help you. Yeah, don't try to fish me. Well, I was going to say. Uh, I was like, hold on, Don, I don't need your computer. Yeah, him to your mailing list. It's <laughs> <laughs> a great, great hazing for the new yeah, employees. That's good. That's and good. you're fired just after two days here. <laughs> well, uh, I want to, I want to have you guys back up here someday. But I want to, like Don said, first, well, let's have some fun with with the other people in, in the yeah. office. And uh, not the other people. I think, I think it should try us. us. Yeah. Oh. Well, I, everybody already knows you can get into my webcam. Well, <laughs> well that's true. So, because you know, a lot of people are if, well. 
I'm, I'm projecting on you guys, but uh-huh. people people are embarrassed. They a don't lot want of to ginger say people, hit, but but we uh, <laughs> we embrace it. Yeah, I mean, you guys, you don't dye your hair. You just go around redheaded your whole lives. And <laughs> so. I mean, you know how much work it is to dye this hair. It's just, it's just that's a great segue, yeah. um, Don. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys for joining us. Thank you for uh, for coming up and uh, appreciate the insight because that's um, you know something that we all kind of deal with on a day to day basis. But uh, to see what we're actually doing to to help fix it uh, is definitely insightful. So thanks for coming up. Thank you. Thanks for having us. All right, and thank you everybody for tuning in. Uh, but don't go away. We have more Technado coming up right after this. Are you a career changer or a budding tech pro who's looking to start their career in IT? I'm Wes Bryan, and along with my fellow IT Pro TV edutainer, Cherokee Boos, we've just shot a new show just for you. Each week, we'll dive into topics to help you launch your career in tech. Watch how to get started in IT on YouTube now. Just head to youtube.com forward slash IT Pro TV to watch and look for new episodes every Saturday at 9 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time. Welcome back to Technado, and thank you for the guys from Stride Point for coming all the way up. That was a lot of fun, and, and fun to hear some stories about uh, about people that have been compromised that aren't you. Oh, I I really do want them to try and, and test against us and see yeah see which one of us fails. I noticed my uh, my security camera at home was moving. The other day. <laughs> was, that, was that you? Uh, no, no. Okay. <laughs> Just gotta check on the dog. <laughs> yeah, gotta check on the dog. <laughs> Why is it facing me though? Uh, all right, want to let you know about a couple of things before we let you go today. First of all, we've got some webinars coming up from IT Pro TV. Head over to itpro.tv slash webinars. You can see all the upcoming ones, all the past ones, but the next one, Post Compromise Tools, brought to you by the Target, Living Off the Land. Uh, that is coming up next Thursday, September 26th, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, with our own Don Bissett and Daniel Lowry. Uh, Lowry. And uh, Daniel uh, was talking today about how he's, he's going to be able to do some cool stuff with... Uh, Getting around the firewall at PowerShell, is that? No, uh, bypassing antivirus. Uh, antivirus, that's yep. what I meant. Taking malware and making it where any antivirus doesn't see it as a virus. That, that's, if, it worries me that if, if Daniel can do that. <laughs> if even Daniel. Yeah, that's <laughs> what I'm saying. Yeah, like, uh, let the record show Justin was not uh, part of this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, his IP address Tomorrow, is, neither yeah. of our laptops work. And yeah. Justin's like, what, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> Do I fine. have antivirus? I'm not Mine even sure. Uh, well, that one, uh, like I said, Thursday, September 26th. Uh, so you can sign up for that at itpro.tv slash webinars. Uh, you can also see all of the past webinars uh, to check out um, – you know, things that you may have missed uh, and still participate in those. And one after that, I think, is something to do with Windows 7 end-of-life support. So, um, I don't know, that's probably targeted towards governments and companies that are huge, and that's hard to switch. Yeah. Right? How many people do you think are going to make the Windows 7 end-of-life? Oh, I bet there's plenty of, like, regular consumers that are still on Windows 7 and have no motivation to upgrade. Yep. So... I mean, it's it certainly affects businesses, oh, yeah. but regular users they get affected too. Yeah, and they and they can attend the webinar as well. It's free. Hmm? Yeah, price is right. But the kind of person that's still on Windows Seven, probably not the kind of person that's coming to the webinar. You never know. You no, never know. I'm I not going to profile contracting, and they were like, "Can you make this web app work in Internet Explorer 6? I'm like, "No, <laughs> no this one is can." 2016. That's a trick question. <laughs> and you know what? I I would buy somebody a Windows 10 license if they sent me a JD Power Award. Ooh, ooh, there you go. Uh, so, he th- he threw it down, app. didn't he? He did <laughs> offer you can't uh, give up. There we've got, uh, you can give maybe the OS2. Yeah, we'll, we'll make box. some room on the shelf. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, I'll give you a Rubik's Cube and Star Trek Deep Space Nine, book one. I don't know what those are. <laughs> I don't know about that stuff. My, my shelf's I over there. Know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I uh, also want to let you know about an offer from IT Pro TV. If you head over to go.itpro.tv slash technado, uh, you can find a coupon code for 30% off your subscription to IT Pro TV. Uh, that's either the individual premium or standard monthly uh, membership, and it's 30% off for the life of your account as long as you keep it active there. Um, Also have information for businesses uh, that want to find out uh, about all the cool things you can do uh, with the Pro Portal and assigning courses and and all that great stuff. So head over to go.itpro.tv slash technado today to check that out. All right, guys, anybody get buzzword bingo? No, No. that was close. Me neither. There was a a lot of of stuff we skirted around. I was really really pumped. I was like, here, oh. No, nope, you got me to say it, zero day, and that that got you so close. Yeah, 
Even if you had set it back to me, I would not have gotten it. I, I have a lot of squares, but not anything that's really connected here. This so. is where I start second guessing myself. Like, did I miss a word? Yeah. I feel like someone I'm said sure we did. Yeah. Like, how do we make it through the whole thing without saying encrypt? Yeah. Or exploit. Or, or Bitcoin. Or, I feel like we said exploit. Oh, I, I don't think we, we talked about say, cryptocurrency at all. We did say Linux. We were talking about. Yeah, we did say Linux. That. Yeah, we didn't have any cryptocurrency stories. It was it was more of a pen testing day than a ransomware day, which is unusual mm. for yeah. us. But it was. Well, we'll see who gets, uh, you know, pwned this week, and we'll we'll have those stories next week on Technado. We'll see you then.